My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased. So that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of the saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. That's kingly talk. A king that can bring up and bring down. You have to have all power and all authority to do this. So we're talking about the exalted Christ. And God has exalted His Christ. And the implications of that fact, are, they're staggering. Our salvation rests upon this truth and our faith depends upon its proclamation. And this is just a precious truth to me because it, it, it's been obscure to me for a very long time. One of the things, uh, as, as the day has dawned and the morning stars rose in my heart, I, one of the things that's become very apparent to me is that God is in control of all things, that God is the king over all the earth. And this is, brings great comfort to me. It's not something that causes me to think that, boy, this sounds like a false doctrine. This is something that's good to me. This is, a, this is obviously the declaration of, of the scripture. And so this is, and I, I found that the things that are once obscure to you, when they're opened up to you, they become the most precious things. <laughs> they're, they're the treasures that were once hid. Now you can lay hold of them. Boy, I want to talk about them a lot. So I'm, I'm excited about this message about the government being upon Christ's shoulders. Now, not much is said in the average preaching agenda because not much is seen that this is necessary. You see, in a lot of places, many people think that once you're saved, you're always saved. And some people are adamantly opposed to that idea and yet practice it. That once you're in, you're good. And so now we've got to get more people in. But see, this is not the... Once we're in, that is good. But we have, we have, we have need of endurance. We have to stay in. And so in order to stay in, in order to, to, to make it from here to heaven, we're going to need a lot of help. So, so the first point I want, to, I want to bring out here is that we need him. We need an exalted Christ. So Christ being exalted is not only appropriate because of who he is, it's needful because of who we are. The great work of salvation cannot be accomplished by a man in the earth. It can only be accomplished by one seated at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. So let's consider how great a work this actually is. Because heaven has gone on record and has declared that woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. See, we are currently residing in a present evil world. We are even in vile bodies. We are in a domain of the wicked one. The earth is a land of trouble. It's a land of turmoil and tribulation. Danger abounds. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual forces of wickedness in high places, along with all workers of iniquity, are being led by that great serpent who is seeking someone to devour. See, if we're gonna, if we're gonna make it from here to heaven safely, we're gonna need a lot of help. That's the point I'm trying to make now. If the saints are gonna keep themselves in the love of God, remain unspotted by the world, Overcome the wicked one. If we're going to rise above the defilements and treachery of the world and remain unscathed, if we're, going, if we're going to be conformed into the image of the Son, being blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, we're going to need a lot of help. 
We're going to need a captain for so great a salvation. We're going to need one who is high and lifted up. We're going to need one with all power in heaven and on earth. We're going to need one upon whom the the government has been put upon his shoulders. Well, my good message to you today is that we have him. And so therefore, though a host encamp against us, our hearts shall not fear. And though war should rise against us, in this we will be confident. For the Lord has set his king upon his holy hill of Zion, and the degree has gone forth from the father to the faithful son, rule in the midst of thine enemies. Now, having come to do the will of the father, and having shoulders capable of bearing such a load... Jesus Christ has been exalted and given a kingdom, even a government. Now, the text we're going to be working with is Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, I just want to affirm right at the start that what Isaiah said shall be, now is. The child is born, the son is given. You see, when God looked upon the face of the earth and he saw that there was no man. And so his own arm brought salvation. And God looked upon the earth and he saw that there was no king to accomplish his eternal purpose. And so he gave us this king. He set his king upon his holy hill of Zion. See, this king, this king is, that's what he's going to do. He's going to carry out God's purposes. And so he needed to give his own king. There wasn't a man that could accomplish this, right? He had to send his own son. Now, right at the offset of our text, we find out that this wasn't this was someone this was someone that was given to us. Unto us he was given. It was unto us. He was not elected by men. In fact, no king really is elected by men. This is not this is not how it works. This is like an illusion that that uh, men experience. But for the powers that be are ordained of God. Particularly, Christ. He's the chosen of God. Of him, God speaks this way. He says, mine elect. (laughs) He elected him. It's my chosen, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, of whom my soul is well pleased. The government, God's government, has been placed upon the shoulder of one whom he himself has chosen and has given unto us. Remember, Simeon saw the Lord's Christ. That's what he saw. He saw the Lord's Christ. And so it is God. Remember, it is God who has made him both Lord and Christ. I know it's commonly said that you should make Jesus your Lord. Well, he is your Lord. Jesus is Lord. It's not really up to you to make him Lord. God has made him both Lord and Christ. It's, it's, it's our part to like just recognize this and bow the knee. That's, like, that's, like, that's our job. All right? We don't make him this. He's already been made Lord and Christ. As it is written, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. No man taketh this honor unto himself. See, Christ's earthly ministry, it was a shadow of his reign. When he was here on the earth, it was was just a shadow of what he would do. In other words, Jesus of Nazareth is a man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs. Those miracles and wonders and signs, they were testimony of who he is. They were testimony of his reign. They were a shadow. This is is the kind of king that you have. And what he's going to do on the earth, he's going to do greater things when he leaves. Amen. These works manifested his government even while he was in the earth. Let's think about a couple of these. Devils and demons. Jesus declared, if I, by the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt, the kingdom of God is come upon you. He is, he is the stronger man who is able to bind the devil. This casting out of devils, it was a demonstration that he had power over principalities and powers and forces of wickedness even while he was in his earthly sojourn. Thus they cried out to him, Are thou come hither to torment us before the time? <laughs> he was even before the time, and that's what he was doing. What about the creation itself? Jesus made known that 
what we could expect of his government when he was when he calmed the great tempest of the sea. The disciples had never seen any power like this and before, and they marveled and said, What manner of men is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. What manner of man this is the manner of man who's going to have the government placed upon his shoulders. And the body, the body itself, the government has been placed upon Christ's shoulders. He's given us a foretaste of it while he uh, in the flesh. He says uh, he showed that his dominion was even over the human body. His work was classified in this way. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And a more lasting and effectual work. The poor have the gospel preached to them. See, see what he was doing in the flesh, he was going to do that spiritually. See, and, and we've all partaken of that. The blind have received sight. Right, the lame do walk. We walk in newness of life. See, this is what he's doing. It was a, it was a picture in his earthly ministry. It was a picture of what he would do when he was seated at the right hand of the Majesty in the heavens. See, brethren, we're now living in the day of salvation. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, "Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night." So, as a result. Of Christ's exaltation, the day of salvation has come, grace has come, strength has come, the kingdom has come, the power of the Lord's Christ is come. Therefore, greater works accompany the partakers of so great a salvation, for he has made them able ministers of a new covenant. Amen. See, our our ministry is it's it's like a it's a therefore ministry. I don't know. (laughs) It's just therefore. Therefore, see, see, all heaven, all, all power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Therefore, because all power has been given unto Christ in heaven and on earth, everything we do is a therefore. We just do it because of that. You see, we have a therefore ministry. Everything believers do, all their acts of righteousness are a product of Christ being exalted. Amen. Their ministry is therefore a therefore ministry. I know that's not the proper grammar, but you get the point, right? All right. Jesus declared, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, you can just fill in the blank. See, therefore, see, we, we love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our strength, all our soul. Why? Because Christ has been exalted. We love the brethren. We love the truth and we rejoice in it. Why? Because Christ has been exalted. That's why. The citizens of the kingdom, they do righteousness. Right? They deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. They live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present. They look for him to come. Why? Because Christ has been exalted. That's why. Because the government's upon his shoulders. Therefore, they do these things. These people are able to joy in their tribulation. They have peace beyond comprehension. They know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. Why is that? The government's been placed on his shoulders. That's why. Because Christ is exalted. That's why. That's why they do these things. <clears throat> They're overcoming the world and overcoming the wicked one are a testimony to the power of Christ and the effectuality of his government. See, everything that, that we get to participate in, our, our walk of faith, our walking by the Spirit, our overcoming these things, they're a testimony not of who we are, not of what we have accomplished, but of his reign. That's why. Because he's been exalted. Now, let's talk about this government. I like the way it's worded in Isaiah. The government. (laughs) It's the government. The government's been put upon his shoulders. So government speaks of rule. It speaks of dominion. The government that has been placed upon Christ's shoulders is not just any government. It's the. It's the government. He's been given the rule. He's been given the dominion. The way it was worded in other places is he's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. It's the government. His government is over every other government. So while God has given Christ authority over all flesh, even his rule is not limited to all flesh. It goes beyond that. His government is over all creation. All things were created by him and through him and for him, and he is upholding all things by the word of his power. He's been given oversight over all things, and all things are put under his feet. He has absolute and total rule. His government is over all. The only one who is accepted from this is his father. Right. The one who did put all things under him. The rule of the one who has had uh, the government placed upon his shoulders is without limit. And in this, we just rejoice because of who he is. (laughs) You want to know the one that has all rule and all dominion, and all power is good. Well, he is good. 
He can do all things, and all things are subjected to him because the government, the government, is upon his shoulders. And so while, see, that's, that's, never, been, that's never been the case before. Men, even kings, have always had to cope with their circumstances. They've always had to deal with their circumstances. Whatever comes their way, they have to adjust right, their, 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 uh, their position. I've got I to gotta adjust to what's going on around me so I can kind of compensate for what's happening. This king is not this. He just makes a way. He's the cause of the circumstances, right? He doesn't have to, he doesn't have to adjust himself. He causes them. So if there, see, see, men, we try to find a way. He makes a way. That's, that's, that's the way it is. Why? Because the government, the government, is upon his shoulders. He has absolute power. So Christ's government is more powerful than any other. It's a government of power. It's, it's, and because of that, it's more effective than any other. It's effective in carrying out God's purpose, you see. No other government is even worthy to be compared to his. Remember, his, his kingdom just smashes into pieces all other kingdoms. <clears throat> and all other dominions, they shall serve and obey his government. <laughs> the other dominions and powers, they serve his. The Lord and his Christ. So we're speaking, I want to talk about this government. We're speaking of a government... We're speaking of a government that, that by speaking frames the, the worlds. <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of rule we have. We want, to, we want to see what kind of power this is. We're speaking about making the sun stand still. That's the kind of power we're talking about. I, don't want, I want to be clear about this. When we're talking about power, this is the kind of power. What other, what other, who else has power to just cause the sun to stand still? Just frame the worlds with a word. We're speaking about causing the rain to cease. Until a government can do that. It has not been given the government that Isaiah spoke of. This government commands the waves just how far to come. <laughs> that's, that's dominion. And contains in its treasury snow and hail. That's like what's in the treasury of, of God's treasury. Snow and hail. And just waits for the time of war and you can just send them out. <clears throat> this is the power of the government that has been placed upon Christ's shoulders. That's what I want you to see now. It's more powerful and therefore more effective because it can reach further and deeper than any other government can. It's spiritual. It can reach this. See, no other government can do this. No other rule. See, other governments just rule over the flesh, over the body. With the tip of the sword, they can get you to go here or there. His government changes hearts. His government changes minds. His government's spiritual. It's a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom reaches places that earthly kingdoms cannot. It's not here or there. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. It's not here. See, it, it transcends all the here's and there's. That's the way his government is. His jurisdiction of this government is not limited by geography. It's, a, it's, not, it's not limited by here or there or times. The supply of help afforded to the citizens of this kingdom exceeds that of any other. The kingdoms of the earth, they, they seek to protect Sometimes feed and clothe those who need it. Sometimes give shelter. This kingdom, which Christ has, been, has received, is able to cause you to inherit cities already built and vineyards planted by another. This kingdom and government can cause the Egyptians to just give you all their riches and then say, see you later. That's the kind of government he has. They just supply you. This king can cause Balaam to bless Israel when it was a desire to curse. He can cause the enemies of Israel, when they're coming against them, to just turn on one another. And you just go and see your salvation and pick up the spoils. That's the kind of government we're talking about. And this government, I'm showing you, has been placed upon Christ's shoulders. The one that you've been placed in. And the one who is in you. The one who is for you. That kind of government. Brethren, who is there to fear? <laughs> this, this is a great source of hope. This is a great source of peace. This is a great source of comfort. I just praise God that he's opened it up to us. <clears throat> it's a government of power. It's also a government of increase. Of its increase, there shall be no end. I like increase. One of the first things, you know, I just thought about this. One of the first things done in the kingdom is like you kind of just define your, your, your boundaries. This is my kingdom. Here, here's, here's, my, uh, here's my habitation. His government has no, has no boundaries. Of his increase, there is no end. There is no end. There's no need for that. There is no, see, that would all, it would only just limit. No matter how big you make them, it would just be a limit. According to the power of the kingdom, it then seeks to enlarge its borders. But see, his kingdom, no borders, because absolute increase. 
And of its increase, there's no end. So not only of his government and of peace, there is no end. Of the increase, there's no end to the increase of it. Well, praise God. It may start off as a small stone, but it becomes a great mountain. It may start off as a mustard seed, but it becomes the biggest tree. You see that? It continues to increase, and it will not be left to another. And see, this increase isn't just, isn't just over others. It isn't just over the world. It's an, it, increases, it increases within you. You see, the government that is upon Christ's shoulders increases within you. See, when you come into Christ, like He has rule over some things. But those things increase. So as, as you mature in Christ, like that, his government, you understand what I'm saying there? His government kind of like takes over your speech. And suddenly things that you used to say, you just stop saying them. You, things you never said, you, now you start saying them. Why? Because his, his government, it's increasing in you, right? And so, and so the things that you do, his government increases. So the more you, the more you progress in Christ, it's a display of the increase of his government, of his rule. And here's the thing, it's not, it's not, it's not forced. We want it. We, see, we, we volunteer freely. We are willing. For this, we ask for it, right? This is a good government, and this is a government we want to increase. Amen. Our thoughts, our desires. See, it gets deeper, it gets further. It's an increase, increasing government. In other words, Christ is perfecting that which he began. It's another way of saying it. So, what of those who refuse his ways? What of those who refuse to bow the knee? Well, of the increase of his government, there is no end. There's no end. He rules over them as well. He is able to use them to accomplish his purposes. He's able to cause them to prophesy without knowing it. He's able to use those who would imprison his servant, servants just so he could use his servant to preach to the jailer. That's, that's how it is. He just uses them. Uh, well, so you can praise God when you get thrown in jail because God, God can use it so you can preach to the jailer. That's how it is. Why? There's no end to the increase of his government. <clears throat> He's able to use persecutions as a means of spreading the gospel. He's able to make a persecutor of the church an apostle. Increase. His rule is such that it makes it hard for those sensitive souls to kick against the pricks. In his rule, the scriptures are filled, and even though men mean it for evil, God meant it for good. That's how it is. It's a display of his government. It's a good government. Isaiah text speaks of judgment and justice. He ordered it with judgment and justice. See, everything is righteous in Christ's government. Nothing's overlooked. Nothing's done like under the table. Everything, every part of it. See, salvation is a detailed operation. It's something that, There's great detail in salvation. That's, that's what we're looking into right now. And in that detail, every part of it, every inch of it, is righteous and just. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. In his kingdom, any and all sin is put away. That's how it is. He just puts it away. All things that offend are expelled. Now the implication is this, if you have things that offend God, you need to expel them before he expels you with them. That's, that's the idea. If they're, if they're a part of you, they're going. You don't want to be attached to them. That's how it is. Well, that's like the first thing in, in, in the circumcision of Christ. Just put it away. He just puts it away from you. <clears throat> all judgments are upright and upheld in heavenly courts. Now you've got to see this. All, when I say all judgments, I, also, I, I mean all things that happen, all things that occur. They're just. They're right. They're toward an end. They're being worked together for his purpose. You've got to see this. Because there's a lot of sloppy talk. There's a lot of, and I know uh, maybe, maybe they're mel, uh, well-meaning people, but it's a foolish thing and it's a wrong thing to like question and to doubt and to get angry with what God is doing. Amen. It's, it's wrong. And when you can see that the government is upon his shoulders, that he has all dominion, then you can see that, well, this is happening. God is able to work it together for good. Remember that Job, boy, Job, Job was a just man. And Job was rebuked. Not because he did something wrong. Remember God said to him, would you condemn me in order to justify yourself? That's, that's the idea, is that we don't, want to try to, we don't want to give up an argument to try to justify ourselves. How come you're letting, look at what I've done. How come you're letting this happen to me? You know, we hear this a lot. But see, that's, that's out of order. Because he's, he's just. Everything that he does is just. His judgments are right. They're perfect. We don't want to lean on our own understanding. We want to trust. See that we want to trust in his work. Amen. The essence of the kingdom, what it really is pertaining to the experience of men in it, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Judgment and justice. It's a good government. Not only that, it's orderly. 
I really like this. He will order it. Christ is ordering his kingdom. In the end, it's, it's described this way. All things are being gathered into one. Order. In Christ, we have the localization of all divine resources. Order. They're all been placed in Christ. How about this? All members of the body are attached to the head. That's order. The citizens are united. Their differences are not a cause of division. Their differences are complementary to one another. Why is that? Because he's ordering his kingdom. We're not spiritual clones. We don't have to be like anybody else. He uses us and uses our differences, uses our individuality, if you want to use that word, to complement one another. Because he's ordering his kingdom. See, this meeting is a display of that. Our, our preaching is a display of that. Is that he's using individual members and he's ordering these things together. And so we don't get together and say, hey, what are you going to say? Then I'll say this. That's not, that's not how it works. We just, just trust that God. Well, Christ will just order it. That's how we'll do it. And I praise God that he's able to order sermons. You know, <laughs> you know, I got some points together. I said, Christ, I need, I need you to order this. I need you to put this together. He's able. He's, he's worthy. He placed all members in the body just as he desires. The assembly of the saints testifies of this, an order in the kingdom. Maybe the, maybe the best uh, display of this is in the cross of Christ. See that he works all things together for good. It's primarily seen in his cross. God worked together all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He worked together the vile inclinations of the people with the faithfulness of his son. He worked those things together. He worked together the scheming of the great dragon to devour the seed of the woman. See, he worked that together with his own good pleasure to put away sin. He just works them together. That's an ordering. He just orders it together. In the cross, God worked together the pouring out of his wrath in justice with a demonstration of his love toward man. And it was then that he worked together the condemnation of sin and the justification of the ungodly. See, he works these things together. He's a wise God. Now, we have a word about governments in the Scripture. I thought this would be appropriate speaking of government. It is actually man's task to be subject to higher powers, recognizing that God has placed them there and that they themselves are accountable to him. Understanding that God is overseeing all powers helps us to readily submit to the powers that be. See, you've got to know that God is over them in order to submit, in order to trust. For there is no power of God, and the power, but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Just ask Pilate. <laughs> Remember Pilate's discussion with, with Christ? He thought he had power to crucify or to re- I have power to crucify or to release you. <laughs> and Jesus cleared it up and said, You could have no power at all against me unless it was given you from above. See, he was given power. And so he could submit to it because God was over it. It's not going to go wrong for you. God is over it. It may not be pleasant along the way, but God is over it. See, Pilate's rule was subservient to Christ. And he would have to give an account for it. Nevertheless, his power was according to the ordinance of God. And remember, it, was, it is God who removes kings and sets up kings. See, when you see this, you can take great comfort and submit. I'm not saying that we submit against the word of God, you understand, but, but we submit to the powers. Because we see that God can work it out. It's he that really elects him. Remember, and even this, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he's able to turn it. Amen. Wherever so he will. It was God who ordained Nebuchadnezzar and brought him against Jerusalem. It was God who used uh, Darius and Alexander after him. It was God who ordained uh, Caiaphas, and it was God who made him prophesy. It was God who ordained Pilate and Herod, and it was God who used them in the putting away of sin. And praise God, it was he who removed them as well. <laughs> he's, he's able to set them up and remove them. So whosoever resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. I don't know if this is like known in, in, in a lot of churches, but whoever resists the, the power is resisting the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. See, it's like a present trend. In modern churches, to like despise, to despise and speak evil of dignities and authorities. And I'm just going to say that this is sinful and dangerous to speak evil of these things. 
Trust God. The spirit of rebellion will have you leaning on your own understanding as if you put that man in power and you want to take him down. You're going to find yourself potentially fighting against God. See, maybe God's put this wicked king in your presence to chastise you. And so you can trust God in it. God raised up wicked kings in order to do this very thing, to chastise his people for wickedness. It was not their task to resist the government, but to wait upon the Lord that he would deliver them. Remember, Israel submitted to Pharaoh and God delivered them. They surrendered to Babylon and 70 years later, they came out. And in both cases, God used wicked governments as his servants and punished them for their desires to harm his people. See, it wasn't overlooked. He left vengeance for the Lord. Now he used them, but see, it was their desire to harm God's people and so they were judged for it. And so we can ask the question, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Speaks of governments this way. He is a minister of God to thee for good. So whether good or wicked, the powers that are ordained of God are for the good of God's people. Now consider Christ Jesus, (laughs) upon whom the government has been placed. He's a worker. Is he not a worker of good for us? In fact, apart from him and his rule, we have no good at all. His ministry, his government is to the end that we, even all the nations of the earth, even all the families of the earth would be blessed. That's the kind of government that he operates. His government ministers blessing to the people and those who oppose him. See, those who oppose governments, are, they're really opposing themselves. They're opposing the ordinance of God. They're opposing, they're opposing themselves and God's working through and in the governments. Well, let's talk about the king. The king spoken of in our text, he accomplishes what no other king could accomplish. The government has been placed upon his shoulder and he's going to do things that nobody else can do. The prophets spoke about his rule and his reign. We have have glimpses of this. I'm only going to touch a few, but to him shall the people be gathered. Daniel spoke of it this way. He would finish the transgression. Make an end of sins. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Like what other king could do that? He can do, he does things. His appointment is to the end that he would do things that nobody else could do. The psalmist spoke of the king's inheritance. Not imperishable riches, but the heathen. Right? That was, that was the inheritance. He spoke of his possessions not being a portion of land, but the uttermost parts of the earth. This king is the king of glory. He's the Lord of hosts and entered into everlasting doors. The king rules in the midst of his enemies and his subjects, his people, they're willing. That's the kind of government he has where the people are willing. Yeah, you really got to wonder where the people are not willing. What's happening? (laughs) Oh, they must not be his people. Because in the day of the king's power, the people shall be willing See, your willingness and the willingness of brethren, it's a testimony of his reign. When you see people that are willing, you want to glorify God because they're willing because he's ruling. That's why. The king is able to carry out God's eternal purpose. He's equal to the task of bringing many sons to glory. I'm just showing you he does things nobody else can do. What other king has been charged with such a task? He's able to enlighten men. (laughs) Just enlighten them. How about that? Those who are... Wayward, he's able to give them repentance. He's able to give sight to the blind. He's able to quicken the dead. No other ruler has ever done this. This king would give the people an understanding that they might know God. He would be the only one worthy to open up the book and to break its seals. (laughs) That's the kind of king. Now his kingdom is a good kingdom. His rule is such because of who he is. He's the one with all authority, all power, all dominion. The one who does whatever he pleases. Now, you've got to see this. The one with all authority, the one with all power, the one with all dominion, the one who does whatever he pleases. This one is pleased to do good. He's pleased to bless. So the one whom all government has been placed under him, this one wants to do good to you. He has been tried in the courts of heaven and he has prevailed. His reign is righteous. He is benevolent. He has been approved by God and appointed for such a work. And God is well pleased with him. And so those who kiss the son will be blessed. The way Isaiah said it is, he's wonderful. (laughs) 
We can all testify this. He's wonderful. When men consider Jesus and perceive him accurately, they bow down to worship and confess that he's, he's a wonder. There's none other like this. He's wonderful. He's altogether lovely. He's a display of majesty and glory. Even the glory of God. He's benevolent. He's going about doing good to his people. He's wonderful. He's full of compassion. He binds up the broken heart. He proclaims liberty to captives. He's righteous. He's justice and judgment are the habitation of his throne and mercy and truth go before his face. That's, that's who we have. He's wonderful. And he's a counselor. He makes known to us what he is doing. He said, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I call you friends. He makes, what a, he's not just sitting in an office where making decisions on behalf of people and they don't, they're, they're not, they're not in tune with it. He makes these things known. Why? Because it blesses the people to know these things. It gives them hope. It gives them faith. It gives them peace to know these things, know what he is doing. And he guides them. He guides them beside still waters and into green pastures. He comforts them. He's compassionate. He can sympathize with our weaknesses and succor us. He's a counselor. He teaches them. <laughs> Jesus teaches his people things that they could not learn they couldn't learn from any other. You can't the things you learn from Christ you can't learn from anyone else. You can't learn from books. You can't even learn from another person. You got to learn it directly from him. You must learn Christ. He gives wisdom and discernment. He's a light to the Gentiles. And he has remember King uh, Ahasuerus during the reign with, with Esther, you couldn't if you, you you couldn't come into his presence unless you were called of him. But see, our king, he's like held out the golden scepter so that we could have an audience with him. He's a counselor. See, he's hold he's held out the go, golden scepter so we can draw near like Esther could. She could draw near the king and have a discussion with. Him. See, that's what he's done. He's held out the golden scepter. We can draw near. See, this king with all power and all authority, he's a counselor. He rules to counsel. His people, I, I praise God for it. He's a mighty God. See, because the things that we're talking about, He's doing only a mighty God can do. Amen. And He's been charged to only do things that only a mighty God. He's not going to do small things. He's doing big things. He has all power, power to remove kings, power to set them up. He's able to make a way. He's able to open blind eyes. He's able to set prisoners free. And if you're exiled to Patmos, He's able to give you a revelation. <laughs> That's the kind of king we have. And how about this? He will not fail. Amen. Nor even be discouraged. The one who's been commissioned to do a great work, he said, I'm, I, he will not fail. Amen. He's the everlasting father, eternal. There's never going to come a time when you have to look to another. And while people around you, the people that help you, people that aid you, if they pass, if they're gone, there's never going to come a time where you have to look to another. He's everlasting father. He's always, he's always going to be there to nourish you. He's always going to be there to care for you. He's everlasting Father, and he's a father. The father, like, like he encourages his people. And he chastens them when, when necessary. And the people are like him. The sons are like the father. That's the idea. He loves them. He's a prince of peace. He can cause you to find favor among enemies. He can reconcile Jew and Gentile. He can bring unity and oneness. And so the peace that he brings is not like a tranquility produced by just avoiding conflict. That's not the peace we're talking about. We're not talking about just like avoiding contact. The, pe the, the, the peace that he, that he gives and the peace that increases is the product of a war. It's a product of a conflict. That's why we have peace. Because enemies have been thrown down. Not just avoided and like escaped and we're going someplace else. He's dealt with them. That's the idea. He brings peace because it comes as a result of victory in battle. In throwing down strongholds and in treading the winepress of the wrath of God. That's why we have peace. And he's made peace through the blood of his cross. And he himself is our peace. Here's my exhortation for you. Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion. And shout in triumph. O daughter of Jerusalem. You see the king has come. And he's come. And he's just. And he's come with salvation. And he's come. We have such a king. And so rejoice greatly. His dominion is from sea even unto sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So rejoice greatly. And he came and he spoke peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near and peace to the heathen of which we fell in. He spoke peace to us. And so rejoice greatly, brethren, for such a king has come and such a king is reigning and such a king is coming again. The government is upon his shoulders.